here we go. Folks, thank you all so much for coming and joining us this evening. We are thrilled here at the Toadstool Bookshop to welcome author Dr. Daniel Fulham O'Neill, uh, who is from New Hampshire, lives, works, resides here. Um, we're always happy to have the Granite State visit us at the Toadstool. <laughs> um, my name is Katrina. I'm the events coordinator. If you're interested in picking up a copy of this book, you can find it at all three Toadstool bookshops in Keene, Peterborough, and Nashua, New Hampshire or on our website, which is www.toadbooks.com. And uh, without further ado, I am gonna give it over to Dr. O'Neill. Please take it away. <laughs> Thanks so much, Katrina. And thank you, Toadstool. And, and thank, um, thank you everybody for showing up. And, and for sure, uh, we've got to support uh, our local bookstores uh, and, and all our local merchants, um, uh, you know, not just now you know, during this pandemic, but always. My book is called Survival of the Fit, and please, along the way, think about some questions, ask some questions, put them into the chat to, to Katrina, and we can answer them, because this is not just something that I have written and now it's over. This is actually a, um, a, a revolution that, that we need to uh, uh, start uh, and, and, and do together. I'm going to try to minimize. Good. Okay. All right, so we have a problem. 30% of our children are overweight, 20% meet the criteria for obesity, 25% of children have diabetes or prediabetes. This is a huge problem. We have children that are sick that are going to school every day, not healthy. This generation will have a shorter lifespan than the previous. And we have not been able to say that very often. We said that in the Black Plague, but we have not been able to say that. And this next generation is, is, is the same, is going, to, going down the same path. In the 1960s, when I was a kid, and we used to steal cigarettes and, and, and smoke our parents' cigarettes, the big concern was, well, you're gonna get lung cancer, you're gonna get emphysema, and yeah, we were going to get that when we were 50 years old or 70 years old. These children now are, are, are not waiting till they're 60 or 70, but they have the diabetes, the high blood pressure, uh, the high cholesterol, the so-called Western diseases now as youths. And this has never happened before. And the other part of this that, that, that is a huge issue that I, that I don't want to minimize is the depression. In other words, the mental illness that goes along with all the physical illness, and this is all uh, together. Back in 2019, I'm not sure if any, any of you remember that far before the pandemic, um, we had a measles outbreak in this country and, and a number of children died. And it was a huge issue. And it was in the front page of all the papers and such. But that was less than a thousand kids died. But now these kids are dying, literally dying because of these diseases. And certainly they're sick and they're not uh, doing well because of the, the problems that they're having, because of their health problems, because of their obesity. Now, here's the issue. We were, we were just talking about the book Sapiens. And one of the problems is is we have not changed since Homo sapiens have evolved. And that was 200,000 years ago. And for a while, the Homo, the Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals were hanging out uh, together, but the Homo sapiens eventually uh, took over. And, and, and we haven't changed. We are evolved as hunter gatherers. We're supposed to be up and moving 10 to 12 miles a day. And again, when you talk about these step counters and the 10,000 steps, that's, that's half of what we should be doing. We should be doing at least twice that, and that's what we're evolved to do. We're also evolved to eat a large variety of foods. So believe it or not, if you survived childbirth, if you survived snakes and, and leopards and, and other horrible uh, things that happened 200,000 years ago, you were a healthier person. The 18 year olds 200,000 years ago would have been the top athletes, would have been the military recruits today. And by the way, four out of five kids today are not eligible for the military because of obesity. 
So we have a problem and it's a two-headed monster. Ultra processed foods and screen time. And again, I know this is no, no big news to anybody, but it's only getting worse. And the reason it's only getting worse is because the forces of evil, the forces of screen time and the forces of ultra processed food are spending not millions, billions, and, and 10 billion is just a, 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 a tiny estimate. It's way over that to advertise to kids to keep these kids addicted and again, I use that word specifically, addicted to ultra processed foods and to screen time. And for any of you over out there who are over the age of 30, you have not really experienced this. This is a new happening. We have no concept of what these five-year-olds, this, uh, the iPhone came out in 2007. So we really don't have any idea of how powerful these forces are if we didn't grow up with them, if we're over the age of 30. But we are the adults in the room. We should be able to do something. We should be able to fight the forces of sugar, fat, and salt and fight the forces of Minecraft and, and Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg. And here's how we can fight it. We can fight it because we can use our primitive brain and we can use our hunter-gatherer past in our favor. And that's because we are born with a physical identity. And this was a, a term that I coined for the book. Your physical identity is programmed in your genetics, programmed in your hunter-gatherer genes. It's how we move. It's why we put dirt in our, our mouths as little kids. It's why we crawl around. It's why two-year-olds are never still. They have a physical identity. They want to engage with puppy dogs and spiders and poison ivy. They don't need to be told that. They don't need to be told, get off the screen and get out and play. They do that. That's their natural state. If we do not allow that natural state to leave them, if they maintain that physical identity throughout their lives, as, as many of us do, things are going to go well. And this whole 80-20 split, uh, and just like everything else in the world, it's, a, it's, it's roughly an 80-20 split. This whole 80-20 split of 80% of kids that are unhealthy compared to 20% of kids that are healthy, we can flip that around. And we literally can flip that around in a generation. Hopefully everybody listening to this has a physical identity. Hopefully your children do, but many of their peers do not. And again, these are the children we have to save. And again, these are a dramatic words that I don't use at all lightly. If children are allowed to keep their physical identity, they're going to continue to be hunter gatherers. They're going to continue to be busy, inquisitive, creative, fun, happy, if we don't let them lose that physical identity. And again, the other point that I, I can't stress enough is we talk about the physical aspects, the Western diseases, but all of these other problems are up. Depression, stress, anxiety, suicide. Not a day goes by where we don't hear about these things. I just heard about this uh, yesterday uh, on the radio. They were talking about uh, the suicide. Um, and again, a lot of this is, is just been accentuated by the COVID. But if you don't take anything else away from this, one of the things that suffers desperately when children are not healthy is academics. You know, we were talking, Katrina and I were talking about this book, uh, Sapiens, and we were talking about what we've been reading. If you are not healthy, you can't be, it, it's hard to be inquisitive. It's hard to have your brain open to new things. And, and that's the job of our schools. When you talk to children about screen time, about video games, about Facebook, they say words like, it's exciting, it's interesting. This stuff is exciting and interesting. 
though I would venture it's not as exciting as interest and interesting as Mother Nature, but this is what these kids are presented with. And as a result, this is what these kids are now addicted to. And they just don't, they're just not getting the alternative enough. And that's our job. Our job is to make sure they never forget that there's a really interesting world out there. And, 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 and having that cold wind on your face, as we've had at least here in New Hampshire in the last few days, can be a beautiful thing. And, and it's something that makes us feel alive and a lot more than anything that they're going to learn from Call of Duty. So what are the other problems? Well, one of the other problems is these kids start the day with a 200 calorie surplus. And by the way, folks, we all start the day with a 200 calorie surplus. But they now, the youth of today can go from cradle to grave without moving. They don't play outdoors. They don't have to walk to school. They don't do pickup games. Everybody will tell you, right? We don't see kids playing on the, you know, we, we pass the playground, we pass the schoolyards in Keene and Peterborough and, and everywhere else in, in, in the United States and not just the United States, but all over Europe and kids are not playing. They don't have morning chores. And if they don't have physical activities as youth, guess what? They're not going to get them as adults because the blue collar and farm jobs are, are fewer and fewer they are getting less physical education. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that. The world has changed. Baby boomers out there, you know this. We have 200 calories that we start the day with that we don't burn because we don't pick up the phone. We don't crank down the car window. We don't manually change channels on television. We don't have to get up to answer the phone. And, and sadly, most of us don't play enough outside. We will not have better math scores until we have better health scores. There is no STEM without fitness. There is no STEM without fitness. We have made a big push in this country to get better math scores, to get better, uh, uh, to get more engineers, to get better English scores. When we did that in 2002, when we instituted No Child Left Behind, we took time away from physical education. We had these kids moving less and what happened to their math scores? What happened to their English scores? Nothing. If anything, they went down. So we're still battling Croatia for math uh, achievement in this country, for number 37 in the world. These kids are not healthy enough to learn calculus and algebra and Ernest Hemingway. Public school physical education is our only hope. These kids are in school 180 days a year. We have to make sure they are moving at least 30 to 45 minutes for 180 days a year. We need to addict them to physical activity. And it's easy because if we don't let their physical identity lapse, they're gonna to wanna to run around. They're gonna to want to participate in high quality, high energy physical activity, because that's what they do. That's what children do. The, the physical education program in our schools is absolutely vital to the health of this next generation. Unfortunately, in addition to the time issue, our PE programs are stuck in the past. And I want any of you professionals to think about this. If anybody from 100 years ago came down and looked at your profession, looked at your job as a, a, a videographer, looked at your job as a physician, looked at your job as a teacher, they wouldn't recognize this. They wouldn't have any idea what was going on. They would see whiteboards and they, they would see this incredible equipment that you can immediately review what you just filmed. They would see surgery suites that, that, that are, are right out of science fiction. However, if Dudley Sargent, uh, one of the pioneers of physical uh, education came down uh, for, uh, 
and watched what happened in physical education classes, he'd be horrified. And by the way, this is not about the quality of our physical education teachers, just like the quality of our, our, our doctors and, and, and teachers and, and, and everyone else, their education has only increased. Their breadth of knowledge has only increased. They have the knowledge and, and the training to get our kids healthy, but they're not given the time, they're not given the opportunity to do this. This is not something that just popped up because of the computer revolution. This is something that was popping up in the industrial revolution. And by the way, if we want, we can really take it back 10,000 years ago to the agricultural revolution. That's when our problems really started. We were bouncing along as, as healthy hunter gatherers for many years. And then people started figuring out how to grow crops in, in, in big ways. And that's when the trouble started. Then the industrial revolution came around and California, again, ahead of their time, saw this. And they instituted two exercise periods a day for kids uh, going to school in 1866, for heaven's sake. And these kids were not on their cell phones at, at night. These kids were not getting the bus to school. These kids were already doing a, a lot. These kids were already doing their nine miles uh, a day as hunter gatherers. And now with the two exercise periods a day, they got it up to 12. We have data to support this in the 21st century. Again, this is not rocket science. This is not uh, something uh, that, that is surprising any of you, I'm sure. We've done the studies. We do not need any more data. We do not need any more studies. We have plenty of data. We have the data to show kids need to get their heart rates up. And, and every panel, every scientific study is going to show this. And this is not one or two days a week. This is every kid every day. Yes, high school seniors need to be getting their heart rate up. When they look at PE classes, again, Dudley Sargent will be horrified. These kids are moving 11 minutes, 16 minutes in another study. And again, we're talking about one or two times a week. So as I talk about in, in survival, we don't have time in gym class to worry about picking teams or trying to learn skills to hit a ball. We've got to get these kids moving the second they step across the threshold. Public school physical education is our only hope for the health of our children going forward. And we have the money. But the problem is, is the money is going to athletics. And this, I know, is something that people don't want to hear. We have the money, but it's going to 16%. And in the study that we did, we had data from across the country. These are the numbers we came up with. 86% of the school budget of the high school budget is going to athletics. I'm sorry, to, to competitive athletics, not to physical education for every kid. And the people that, that are uh, taking advantage of that 86% uh, percent of the budget is our 16% of the school population. What we're seeing and what this is, uh, is um, accentuating is this athlete and non-athlete divide. And this is another huge problem that we're seeing. And this is another huge component of the computer revolution. Kids are identifying as athletes at the age of seven. And then those kids are going on to a path of physical identity. And those are the 20%. Unfortunately, that other 80% are non-athletes. When, when we were kids, when those of you over uh, 30 or 40 or 50 were kids, even if you weren't playing organized ball, you were playing out in the woods, you were, you were playing in the city parks, you were swimming, you were, you were getting into trouble, you were building forts, you were riding your bike. This concept of athlete, non-athlete. But the problem is, is that once a child identifies as a non-athlete, he has this other option, this option that he considers, quote, interesting and, quote, exciting, and that's the computer and that's the couch. The world has changed. Some kids are, getting, are taking advantage of it, but again, the vast majority of our kids are not. Another study we did with the book 
that, that some of you might be surprised at is that the kids that are going to colleges, and this includes the University of Vermont and New Hampshire, and, and again, we did this study uh, fr from multiple universities and colleges across the country, the athletic scholarships for, for what I defined as suburban sports, soccer, field hockey, lacrosse, ice hockey even, these kids are not the have-nots. We are not taking these kids off the uh, the the streets and 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 out of the, the 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 pitch and teaching them to play soccer and and then to get a college scholarship. So again, I'm not talking about football and 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 basketball, though. I suspect that it, it's not too far off in a, in more instances than you would believe. Perhaps only at the top uh, D1. However, in these other sports, unless your parents have the wherewithal to have you participating in sports, starting again at a very young age and participating in field hockey and lacrosse and going to the camps and going to play hockey and, and ski race in the summer, you're not going to make the high school team. You're certainly not going to get a college scholarship. The role of the public school is not to produce athletes for college and the pros. The role is to educate our children. The role is to make sure we have happy, healthy adults. And after that, after the age of 18, what happens then is, is, is you know, something we can't control. But we need to make sure that we are not only graduating kids who have read Toni Morrison, but graduate kids that are healthy. Dwight Eisenhower recognized this. Jack Kennedy then really took this off. They realized, Dwight Eisenhower realized just a few years after uh, Korea, our, our, our youth were getting soft. Uh, they couldn't compete with the youth in Europe. They uh, were having more television that was uh, coming into uh, people's homes. Uh, there were fewer farm jobs and the uh, uh, mil uh, industrial uh, machines were getting more efficient. So people were doing less. Dwight Eisenhower was horrified as a, as a previous general because he was horrified that our military was gonna be soft. Jack Kennedy bumped it up, but, but this is not happening, happening anymore at the national level. Uh, and and uh, we're actually just getting a little bit of excitement uh, from Governor Sununu here in New Hampshire uh, at, at, at our level, but it's still not enough. Here's what kids need to graduate from high school. They need to know some American history, some world history, some English, a foreign language. They need to know at least up through algebra. They need to have some numeracy. They need to be able to do a plank. They need to be able to do a few sit-ups. They need to not have diabetes. They need to not have high blood pressure. They need to not have obesity. They need to be able to squat and, and, and pull themselves up uh, over a wall. This is a sixth grade reading level. These kids need to be healthy. They have to have a physical identity. Ideally, every kid that graduates uh, should be able to run and cycle and swim. So what do we do? We know PE is absolutely necessary. Why don't we rebrand it? So again, and I'm talking to you people my age out there, some of you had miserable PE experiences. I get that. The, uh, some of the things that they did in the President's Council testing was, was pretty nasty and, and uh, degrading oftentimes. But why don't we rebrand things? We're, we're America, we can do these things. And by the way, the rest of the world will be delighted because the rest of the world has these same problems. Let's rebrand it. Let's get the folks from Silicon Valley to find a swoosh for physical education. There is hope because it is our natural state to be part of the outdoors. That is what we have going for us. It's our physical identity. It is hardwired. So in conclusion, in no particular order, obesity and poor fitness is expensive. We didn't even talk about that. We said that they spend billions and billions on advertising. Well, guess what? We're already spending billions and billions. 
In, in New Hampshire alone, in Vermont alone, we are spending in the millions and millions on youth health. And again, not just physical health, but mental health. And it is because these kids are not fit, is because these kids have lost their physical identity. It is costing us a lot more than college scholarship money. Our children are addicted, again, addicted to bad food and screen time. There is no STEM without fitness. We are, we are not going to cure this with a negative. We have a positive, we have physical identity. We've got to use that. Just say no does not work because Steve Jobs and his minions that, that are now working are going to make sure if you try to say no, they're going to figure out a way to change your mind. They're going to figure out, Ronald McDonald's going to figure out that other special ingredient to make sure you keep addicted to that food. You're not a non-athlete at the age of seven. If we maintain our physical identity, this is all gonna change and physical education is our only hope. And now most importantly, we need a revolution. We need you, all of you out there to be part of this revolution. I talk about it in the book in detail, how you can be part of that. I talk about it at the website, survivalofthefit.net. I need your input. At, at my uh, email and at the website, we need to work on this together. We need to work on this as grassroots and we need to work on it uh, uh, at the state uh, level, at the local uh, school district level. You've got to get this book into the hands of the PTA, of your school board, of your administrators. We've got to start this because if we don't, we're going to have another generation that will be sick again. And, and it, it's not only that it's, it's, it's horrible, but this generation is not having fun. And, and when we were kids, we had fun and, 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 and that's not happening anymore. So thank you. Um, I hope you've asked some questions and, and uh, please send in some questions right now to Katrina and we can uh, to answer some of them. I'm not sure, Katrina, I'm gonna push stop share. All righty. And then it should just bring up one of our faces. Ah, I love it. it. <laughs> I love it. I love um, it. So I do have a couple of questions. Um, the first is, what can we as community members do to advocate for the the shift towards encouraging children's inquisitive natures and, and being outdoors and and changing the way we approach uh, phys ed? Yeah, exactly. This is something we all can do, and we can all do it. On, on even tiny levels. So, so for instance, at the school level, making sure the music teachers are clued on on this. Again, it's amazing. And I, I'm sorry to say that a lot of teachers, when we talk about this, they didn't know, they didn't realize the very clear connection between academic achievement and, and activity. And, um, you know, before, before you do anything, before you take that SAT, before you uh, do anything that involves uh, intellectual uh, uh, thought, if you get your heart rate up, if you rev up your heart rate, you're also revving up your brain. So these things are intimately connected. So what we can do on the community level is that every, every step of the way, how can we build in more activity? How can we build in uh, easier access to that activity. So, you know, if there's ever a chance to put in a walking path in your town, if there's ever a chance to to vote to get some uh, 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 a cycling uh, paths, you know, the rails to trails, we are always in favor of that because that is going to not only change our community for the better. And, 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 and you know that the communities that have these things, when you go visit any of these towns that have a wonderful bike path or, or, or a ski hill in the community, that, that just changes everything. So anytime we get that option, but also, as I was saying, the music teacher, how can you build getting these kids up and moving with their instruments, with their singing? You know, you don't have to be sitting down while you're singing. It's, it's, counterproductive anyway. 
and exactly. getting up, up and right and getting them up and moving. In the art world, we can get them outside painting. Let's go for a walk. You know, in social studies, can we walk downtown to that uh, museum or, or to that historic site? We just got to start thinking as, a, as an entire community, as an entire unit, how can I get moving? And oh, by the way, the uh, you know the the old thing of parking your car, you know, farther away, or you know, doing little things like that to to get you moving, and not always making things convenient for yourself. Um, but it becomes a mindset. But if we just keep planting that seed, and and we start thinking about it, particularly with our kids, that's going to 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 make be part of the revolution. And for sure talking to our select men and, and, and women and, and, and again, super superintendents and stuff. And how, how, how are you doing? What are you doing, Superintendent Jones? You know, this guy O'Neill is talking a lot about how our kids are not healthy enough to learn. What are you doing about it? How are we making a change? And if we can do that, it's going to make a change. I think it's really interesting that you bring up um, the other teachers in the school. Um, I have a background in education. Um, that's what I went to college for. That's what I kind of do, um, not through a school, but through the Boys and Girls Club of America um, on the side in pre-pandemic times. <laughs> um, and I, I do think it's, it's, it's interesting that you bring up so many of them don't realize this connection because I think that there's a great opportunity, especially in classrooms like music and theater and, and all the electives that are kind of lumped in with phys ed as specials, they're just as vital to a child's education. There's a, a great opportunity there for you to, to use the full body in music making or in art making. Um, I, I really do think, especially if you're an educator, um, you should advocate to your colleagues, you know, and, and kind of plant the seed there so that they take it upon themselves. Anyway, sorry, I just don't. Yeah. No, I, I think that's when teachers when teachers really yeah. grab on and, and try yeah. and make it an immersive experience yeah. for a child. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and I, and I, I think I started this uh, project and there was a little bit of pushback because the, the book is published through, through Teachers College Press at, at Columbia University. And there are a lot of teachers out there and there are art teachers, excuse me, and music teachers. And I believe it or not, I think, and I don't want to go to the mats with anybody on this, but I think if I had a fight, I would be fighting with the classroom teachers to give up some of their time. Because again, if we cut down that classroom time from 45 minutes to 40 minutes, and these kids are moving for the extra five minutes, we add up that five minutes here and there and everywhere that these kids are gonna be more engaged for those 40 minutes. You know, in other words, it's a question of quality. And, and again, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think that there's so, you know, that the, the other uh, 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 specials are, uh, of art and music uh, are, are so important. And, um, but we, it's gotta be everything, but we've all gotta be pulling together on this and get everybody moving. And then we're really going to have that revolution. Um, we have another question from Peter who asks, what do people, especially those in power need to hear to get them to act and to get them on board? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, I, I worry sometimes that I'm a bit of a Cassandra and I'm, gloom and doom. And particularly in this last year, we really probably need less gloom and doom. Um, for instance, I've been saying now in the last few weeks, uh, we should be showing a, 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 a scroll of how many people are vaccinated every day. So every day we wake up and we find out that, you know, uh, in another 2,000, 3,000 people in New Hampshire or, or in Vermont or have been vaccinated. And, you know, something positive, something, something happy. But I think that this is a, a, a bit of a gloom and doom scenario. And, and I, I don't think we need to sugarcoat it. Um, that if we, we have to tell our, our, our legislators, and, and I, I would love to get the, the ear of uh, uh, Secretary Edel Blue, uh, 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 the Secretary of Education, for them to really appreciate that this is it. This is the 
one thing you can do that will truly revolutionize our children's education. If we get these kids moving every day, every grade, every school year, that's the revolution. That's the secret sauce. You know, that, that's, that, that's all it is. And we have it, we have, the, we have the money, we have the knowledge, we have great teachers out there. We've got it. We don't need to reinvent anything. And the other brilliant thing, Katrina, uh, uh, about this subject is I get very few people disagreeing with me because everybody says you know, the same thing. They say, oh my God, kids don't play enough anymore. Kids don't have enough fun. Kids are not p- doing pickup games and just running around like we used to do as kids. Everybody agrees with this and the powers that be have the power to do something about it. But my theory is, is the powers that be are in their 50s and in their 60s and they don't get it. They don't get that these kids are not necessarily even choosing to play video games. They are addicted to the video games. You know, they, they're not choosing unhealthy food over healthy food. They're addicted to the unhealthy food. I've been working with uh, 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 a fellow from uh, Johnson and Wales, and he uh, read my book and got excited. And he wants to talk about the whole uh, uh, ultra processed food concept and bringing that. And of course, that's a huge thing. So, if you want to get the uh, powers that be to do something else, it's getting you know healthy food in, into uh, our cafeterias also. But but yes, they have enormous power. It's it's just absolutely incredible to me that the secretary of education of any given state Mm -hmm. could really get it done. Secretary of education in the, in the, uh, in Washington, DC, not so much because as you know, many school districts, it's, it's really comes down to the district. And by the way, the secretary of education of the state would want to pass the buck and say, well, I don't have the power to do that. But in truth, they actually do because they have a lot of the purse strings, you know, at the state level. Yeah. Um, Another question. Um, when it comes to, you know, children viewing themselves as athletes versus non-athletes in, in a perfect world where kids sort of divest themselves from those identities and recognize the joy of sport without necessarily being competitive, how do you talk to like the football dad who cannot fathom not mm-hmm. seeing his child play varsity sports the same way that he did? How do, how do you approach these parents who perhaps have this ultra competitive view and they want that for their kids. Um, how, how do you kind of approach them and say, it's about, it's about the game, not about the win. I'm not even telling them not to play competitive sports. I love competitive sports. I'm a competitive guy. Uh, I played competitive sports. What, what I'm proposing is that our school's job is not competitive sports. Our school's job is education and it's not education for 16%. It's education for 100%. I think that competitive sports can be part, uh, should be part of the community. And and this is what is uh, uh, done in uh, most countries. It's it's a community uh, sponsored um, activity and whether it's it's ski racing or whether it's football or, or, or soccer or or uh, 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 hurling in uh, Ireland or whatever it might be. So, but it's not the job of the schools. And this is where we've gotten ourselves kind of down the rabbit hole. We've conflated education with competitive sports. And as a sports medicine doctor and, uh, and, and someone with a degree in exercise and sports psychology, I find it heartbreaking when I hear about a child that says, or a parent that says, well, if it wasn't for hockey, if it wasn't for football, my kid wouldn't go to school or my, and that absolutely breaks my heart because that's, that's not the job of the school. Uh, And I know that I'm a bit uh, of, uh, of an optimist and I call myself a despairing optimist, but I want every child to actually be interested in some subject at school and, and to be interested in Beethoven, to be interested in art, to be interested in photography, to have find something in school and to be fit enough 
And this is where the school comes in. The job of our schools is to make sure those children are fit enough to play competitive sports and to, to join those you know, community teams as it were, and then get their college scholarships or play in the pros or go to the Olympics. But it's not the job of our schools to make sure, our job of our schools is to make sure they're fit enough to play competitive sports. If anybody has any other questions, please feel free to use the chat function. It's right down at the bottom. Um, I had a thought and you're gonna have to bear with me because I did have one and I have to wait for it to come back now. <laughs> My little ADD brain is, is eventually gonna make it. Ah, for those of us who are adults with kids in our lives, not necessarily parents, not necessarily anybody with an involvement to the school, how would you ask those adults to foster this in the kids in their lives? Kick them outside, get the kids yeah. outside and don't let them come back in, lock the door. <laughs> yeah, and, and but the beautiful thing is, I mean, it, it sounds, you know, obviously uh, silly, but to a certain extent, that's what a lot of kids, a lot of people my age will say when they were kids. We, you either got outside as fast as possible because your parents threw you outside to get you out of their hair, or you got outside because you wanted to make sure you weren't around for them to see you, for you to do something, whether it's vacuum or whether it's, you know, sand uh, uh, an old chair or whether it's mow the lawn or, or whatever it might be. So, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And, and so our job uh, as kids, uh, uh, we had to dust and, and, and vacuum the house every morning and do the dishes and get that done. And let me tell you something, my brother and I blasted through that and we got the heck out of there before uh, our parents found something else for us to do. And so I really do think parents need to get the kids away from that addictive machine and whatever way they can. And to send them outside, obviously with their cell phone is not particularly useful. The food is also something that, you know, you can fill your pantry with healthier food and, 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 you know, it, it, you can do it. I know it's hard. And what I would say, uh, Katrina, to your, your parents out there, particularly with the younger kids, if we start them out and we don't let them fall into the trap of being a, a, um, babysat by the television or the iPad, mm -hmm. it's going to be a lot easier going down the road. And I get it. Uh, you know, we all have children in our lives. We all want them to just be quiet so we could read for a minute or, or talk to Uncle Bill for a minute or, you know, have a, a relaxing drink or whatever it might be. But I would say to you that by putting that pad in, it's not like the old days where you gave them a comic book or you gave them something to distract them or a coloring book. When you give them that iPad, you are giving them a insanely addictive weapon. You were giving them, you were giving them Mark Zuckerberg and his millions and millions of employees whose job it is to take your two-year-old and to addict your two-year-old. And again, I, I, it's, it's, I'm making it sound dramatic, but it is dramatic. It is, it is absolutely dramatic and, 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 and amazing and something that you as a 40-year-old or 50-year-old I don't think really understand. And believe me, I don't understand it because I wasn't addicted to it. I didn't grow up with it. But we know for a fact because we have the data. The kids are addicted. You can't let them get addicted. If you can fight that at the ages two through seven, then your world's going to be a lot better. Then the kid's not going to be addicted to this stuff. The kid will maintain their physical identity and your life will be puddle wonderful. <laughs> So do you, so should we end on a happy note like that? I would love that. I, I think <laughs> like, you're right though. There is a lot of hope. It's, it's not, it is something very intrinsic to us. We, we are curious. We want to explore. We want to touch things. We want to touch the fire to see if it's actually hot. Um, it's, and being able to see something done like manually, you talk about, you know, the blue collar work is, is different now than it was 
you know, even 50, 60, 70 years ago, um, farm jobs, you're right, there's, there's not as much work in agriculture now as there was, especially around here, you, you think of all the farms that have closed or have been divided oh, up. Um, kids are really into seeing stuff done like in an old fashioned way, they have never, they have no concept of what that is. And I think that you're right. They, they want to learn. They want to, to get in touch with it because it's something new to them. It's ex it is exciting. And I think just showing them that, you know, basic things like, you know, washing your dishes by hand or taking the dog out for a walk instead of just letting them go in the backyard. Those things can be exciting and those things can be engaging. I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> absolutely right. And I would, I would say that, uh, for instance, I would dare a child to go to Nelson's candy store and go in the back room and, and see how the fudge is made and get their hands, you know, touching this stuff and smelling this stuff. And that's three dimensions, you know, that's where it's happening. And especially- We keep the taffy puller right in the window. There you go, exactly. And, um, and I'll just say one more thing actually that, that, that um, um, Donald Hall, uh, you know, one of your neighbors from Sunapi, when they opened, they opened a factory in town and um, I forget what they were making now down in Sunapee. So this was, you know, whatever, a hundred years ago or, or, or 70, 80 years ago. And the farmers around there were saying, these guys were only working six days a week in this factory. And the farmers were like, that's not work. You're only working six days a week. <laughs> and, and they would, you know, <laughs> clock out. And, you, and you're absolutely right. Once we stopped working, uh, on the farm and even before that as the hunter gatherers you know you were just you got up every day and you started hunting and gathering and uh, yeah it's 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 but but if you give kids three dimensions to work with they're going to pick three dimensions and they're going to pick something with a smell and something with a feel and something you know that they can grab every time every time yeah well thank you so much everyone and thank you katrina and thank you totes tool uh, bookshops and and um, this was very fun. Thank you so much. This is very powerful. Uh, Fran says that she'd like to share it with her family members too, especially those with young kids. You know, I love it. Just Katrina, you. is this has this been taped at all? By the way, can they share this mm -hmm. yep. through the Toadstool uh, website or? Yep, awesome. it should be up by the end of the weekend. Oh, fantastic! I have to wait till I get back to work on Sunday, but um. <laughs> Yes, it, it will be available. It's, uh, just toadbooks.com. You can check out our whole website. There's a search function. There's whatever you need. We'll ship it to you. And right at the top, there's a tab that says event recordings. And that oh, is where the video it. will be hosted. So you'll be able love to see it there by the end of the weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you in three dimensions. Uh, and you know really where I hope to see you soon. It's true. <laughs> All right. Take care now. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye.